So um, I'm going to talk about this, this topic. Um, I haven't been working um, on this by myself. I've been working uh, with some colleagues, um, Carlotta from the Health Foundation, who's a data manager there, and also Christine Woods from the UK Data Service. Um, so we've been working on this for probably about a year and a half now, um, and we now have a what we call a, a final um, professional development framework for people um, accessing data in, in safe settings. So obviously we're generally most, I, I'm assuming most of the audience here are, are researchers or people who want to use data. Um, is there anybody else in the room that might be from a data supplier or a government department? Oh, okay, so where are you from? Oh, right, okay. So I have to be a little bit careful what I say then. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like the average typical civil servant I say with a t-shirt on, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's nice. Um, okay, well, of course, we all need data. Um, and at Cancer Research UK, along with other research institutes, data is, is really the heart of what we do. Um, and more and more as researchers and the research community, we're, we're interested in much more detailed um, information about data. So, for example, we're interested in pulling up um, uh, data about education, health records, uh, tax and benefits, um, our shopping habits, what music we listen to, um, what we eat, what we drink, and information about our families as, as well. Um, and this is really just the top of the iceberg. And not only do we want to analyze these data separately, we actually want to link these data together because by linking these sources of data together we can um, explain a lot more about um, how we behave as individuals um, and as a society. And of course once you start using data like these and you, especially when you begin linking these sources of data together then the data become much more sensitive because there's a risk that somebody could be identified from the data um, and that would breach all kinds of confidentiality and data protection issues. And that's why we have these safe settings like Tanby was just talking about to make sure that research can, can occur with these data but within a, a safe environment. And we, we, we as I say, we, we use these data because we want to produce statistics um, which can then go on to inform um, public policy and, and hopefully make um, our lives and our society better. So a little bit about the good, the bad and the ugly of, of data access. So um, I've been in this field for about 11 years now and things have improved immensely during that time. I actually started my career at the Office for National Statistics in their virtual micro data laboratory. Um, and since then, a, a huge, huge number of um, administrative data sources have now become available. Um, there are many more researchers accessing these types of data than, than ever before. And that's that's in down part thanks to services like the UK Data Service, um, the Administrative Data Research Network um, and NHS Digital. Um, things can still be a bit slow sometimes, um, but you know, at, at least uh, it is possible to access data. Um, and UK Data Service and, and people like ADRN do a fantastic job as well as just providing access to data, but also providing information about data. So good standards for metadata and data documentation. Um, those are really um, key, uh, key elements which make it easier and more effective to do research. But not everybody is, is like UK Data Service or ADRN. Um, and there's yeah, quite often, as well as delays, um, often data come poorly documented. And quite often, we spend quite a lot of time working out what the data are showing before we can even start using the data properly for analysis. Um, so that's a bad. And the ugly, um, sometimes data access is, is never going to happen or work so slowly that we end up abandoning projects. Um, and my team have abandoned one project now that we'd applied for nearly 12 months ago. Um, it took so long that actually it's not feasible for us in our current work plan to carry on with that work. That was going to be a nice bit of work about um, the variation of treatment for lung cancer, which is, you know, quite a, uh, like any project, it's quite important. And we've had to, had to drop that one now because we couldn't get the data in time, um, despite spending quite a lot of time trying to apply to access for the data. 
Um, and generally, this kind of, of situation will just lead to poor outcomes because there's a lot less we know about society as a result. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. A waste of, well, it is a waste <laughs> of money, yes. Um, so, in general, though, I think that um, most data owners, be them government agencies or government departments, are, are generally willing to make data available. And certainly at the top of government, I think that willingness is, is there. Um, so, for example, if we speak to the chief executive of Public Health England, Duncan Selby, he's, he's very committed to making data available for research. The problem is it never quite gets off the ground, and that's what I want to kind of talk about today. So what, is, what are the practical, practicalities of making data available, um, and who's going to make this happen? Because quite often we're talking about um, relatively junior civil servants within government departments who are going to be charged with making this happen. Do they have the support and the skills needed to actually um, enable access to data? There's definitely the buy-in at the top. The question is, is there buy-in and the ca capability at the bottom? So, what's the problem? Um, well, first of all, those staff I've just mentioned take on quite a lot of risk for making data available to researchers, and they often receive very little reward. So that's a bit of a problem. If you're a relatively junior civil service manager um, and you make access to data available and it goes wrong, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So the safest thing you can do is make it as difficult as possible or, or not make data available at all. And, and I think that's, you know, from my experience of government, that happens quite, quite regularly. So that's coupled with the fact that often staff aren't confident to make the right decisions when they're providing access to data. Um, and so then we've got to think about why is, are they lacking in confidence? Um, quite often there will be data access teams where civil servants have been drafted in. They might have been moved around from other parts of that department. They might not have any expertise or background in data or data access. They've just been put in this role and said, this is what you're going to do. So they're going to be lacking confidence. And that coupled with the fact that they're taking on a certain amount of risk means that they're generally going to be quite risk-averse individuals. Um, and in addition to that, um, there's, a, there's a lack of investment, I think, in the staff who are making data access possible, um, which is really the kind of a central theme of, of this presentation. As researchers and, and people applying to access data, what, what do we ex expect? So we expect that when we liaise with these agencies to access data, um, that they understand why we're applying to access their data, um, that they understand what research is and why research is important. We, we kind of generally expect that, I think. Um, we would hope that they would understand the data that we're applying to access, that they understand their own data. We would hope that they can produce metadata and the accompanying documentation that comes with the data. We would also hope that they can provide us with legally sound advice, which isn't necessarily that the law is there to protect data and stop access. Often the law is there to actually enable access to data. And for all of those of you who have been involved in the GDPR, you've probably sort of thought of GDPR perhaps as compliance. GDPR has actually got a lot of stuff in there about making available access to data for scientific research. Um, we also expect them to provide us with support, and we would like to have an efficient, fast service as well. Um, I don't think anyone's kind of expecting data to come within a week of applying, um, wonderful as that would be, um, but we definitely don't want to get to a stage where it takes you know, a third or a half of somebody's PhD programme, for example, before they even get to see the data. We want things to be a little bit quicker than that. So we started, so myself, Carlotta and Christine and, and a group I'm going to talk about in a moment started thinking about this and, and started thinking, well, is this field, is the data access and data support field, um, the things that we do for researchers and analysts, is it really seen as a profession? Um, or is it just something that we end up falling into by accident and perhaps some of us stay in this field because we quite like it and find it interesting um, to work with researchers? Um, 
And is there any professional development that we can follow to enable us to provide an effective service um, for, for researchers and also for data suppliers? Um, and we thought, well, actually, there's, there's very little. Um, if you're within government departments, you might be a member of one of the professions like the government statistical service of a government economic service where you, you might start to handle data a little bit. There's now a, a stream, a strand of government statistical service to deal with data science, um, but I'm not really sure to what extent that's actually um, developing a staff of, with, with skills from managing access to data. So, um, the Working Group for Secure Data Access Professionals that I now chair and that um, Tanvi chaired previously to me um, was established in 2011 um, and it's basically a group of people who are providing secure access to sensitive data to, to meet, facilitate um, uh, development of standards, to share views and experience etc. We've got a number of members now um, including myself from Cancer Research UK, Office for National Statistics, NHS Scotland, HMRC, UK Data Service Health Foundation and recently Connected Health Cities um, and University of Edinburgh um, and, and I hope that members of the ADRN will still keep a part of that, uh, stay in, in that network. Um, and essentially we started thinking about the problems of providing access to secure data and identified as a bunch of people doing this work, as I say, what is there for us in terms of career development and our ability to progress ourselves? Because if that isn't, if that's not in place, then we are likely to, to move away from these positions and then for the researchers who are trying to apply to access these data, they're just going to be presented with somebody who doesn't understand data, doesn't understand research, etc. So we began putting together um, what we call a competency framework um, and um, the competency framework uh, looks very much like a, a civil service progression route. It covers a number of areas which we think are important for staff um, who are in contact with researchers accessing data. Um, so for example, we think that staff should be aware of what analysis is all about, should have an understanding of data legislation, be it um, Statistics <coughs> and Registration Services Act, or the Digital Economy Act, or GDPR, or Health and Social Care Act, etc. Um, they should have experience of um, handling and managing data, including adding value to data as well, because there's nothing worse, um, from my experience of research, of getting a research data set where variable names are confusing and there aren't any labels. So we would expect that staff can actually kind of you know, add that metadata. And they should be aware of data settings, data management. They should have experience, of, hopefully, of supporting people and managing users as well. This is really important. Um, statistical disclosure control is a, an important skill if you're working within a safe setting. Um, and um, you know, they should be able to train, train staff um, and, and users as well. And what we did was we put this competency framework together with these skills um, and we set targets for beginners, people with perhaps one to two years of experience and people with a little bit more experience as well. And the idea of this is that as members of staff, they've actually got a framework by which they can develop themselves um, and continue working in this field and develop themselves as data access professionals. And what we think this will provide is um, expertise, which is really, really important. Um, it will also provide a career development pathway. Hopefully it will mean that staff retention is much better. I know of one government department where staff come and go roughly every three months in the middle of the applications. It's, it's really frustrating actually, but I can understand actually why they're moving on. Um, and this makes the whole process of applying to access data and these secure data, administrative data, um, more, much more efficient. Um, and I think it's also worth saying that there are going to be more of these settings um, around in the future. Um, yesterday I read the government response to the Lord's report on artificial intelligence. There's a lot of stuff in there about data settings be, and, and more of these coming about. So we obviously need more staff to actually man these settings and therefore we need people with the right skills, the skills like I mentioned previously. Um, so yeah, 
we, we need some kind of framework, and I think this is what the, um, the Secure Data Access Professionals Working Group have put together, um, which you can now find on our website. And if you've got any questions or you'd like to talk to me about this a bit further, my email address is at the bottom as, as well. But you can now go to our, our group's website, go to Guides and Resources, download the Competency Framework. Um, and I, I found it really useful for myself. I've actually just recruited somebody to assist me with some of my data access work. Um, so it's been really neat to be able to put, uh, put together a program of work for this person based on this framework. Um, and you know, these are kind of niche skills. It's very difficult to recruit people into these roles. I work in the centre of London. When we recruited this person, we maybe had mm, maybe three or four feasible applicants. And we're just down the road from Tech City, and you would have thought maybe we might have had a few more. So it is important that we get more of these people trained up and skilled to do this work, because unless researchers actually want to do all of that themselves and not do research, I think we're going to need many more of these staff working in this field. Okay, thank you. Thank you.